I'm Lisa Fletcher, and you're in the stream. Today, has the time come for China to re-examine its one-child policy? As always, our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is here going through all your live feedback as it comes in. Malika, the Chinese government says the one-child policy has been really effective in controlling population. What's the community saying about all this? Well, we specifically asked our community if they think that the government should have a right to tell people how many children they can have to control population. And this, the answers were surprising, but people said it's a complicated situation. So whether you agree or disagree with that, join the conversation. J tweet us using the hashtag AJStream. To Malika's right is Kelly Curry, a senior fellow at Project 2049 Institute, an organization that works to guide decision makers toward a more secure Asia. Kelly, thanks for being here. Thank you. My pleasure. There are a lot of ways that you can be in the stream. Twitter, Facebook, Google+, just to name a few. Another way is to submit a video. It's really easy. Simply go to stream.aljazeera.com, and on the right, right over here, you see that? It says <laughs> record your comment. Just hit that and record your comment. So in three easy steps, you will be able to be in the stream. Hey, I'm Mass Ali Madani. I'm a recent University of Toronto graduate, a writer, aspiring journalist, and I'm in the stream. So should China switch to a two-child policy? Many think so, including a government-affiliated think tank. Three Chinese researchers with the Development Research Center ignited a national debate when they called on China to adjust its one-child policy as soon as possible to avoid what they called a demographic crisis. The longer we wait, they wrote, the more vulnerable we will be. On September 25, 1980, the Chinese government instituted its one-child policy to be in place for 30 years. But it's still in force today. Since the day the policy began, horrible things have happened. When families can have only one child, they choose boys. Mothers who give birth to baby girls are condemned within their culture and are often rejected by their husbands or in-laws. Trying again for a boy is dangerous. Second-time mothers face exorbitant fines or a forced abortion. Now, China's leaders have credited the one-child policy with controlling the growing population and preventing nearly 400 million births in the last 30 years. But when graphic images of 22-year-old Feng Zhanmei appeared after she was forced to have an abortion while seven months pregnant because she and her husband couldn't afford the $6,325 fee for having a second child, the people of China and the world saw a different side to the policy. Years ago, Feng's suffering would have gone unnoticed and probably completely untold. But things may be changing in China. Her outraged relatives used social media to share Feng's experience. They uploaded graphic images of her dead baby laying along her side to the Internet in protest for millions to see. Many expressed outrage, and public discussion began. Chinese officials have since apologized to Feng's family and agreed to pay them $9,000 in compensation. So, does the one-child policy still make sense for China, or are the researchers right in calling for a change? To help us answer some of these questions, we are joined by Chai Ling. She comes to us via Skype from Boston, where she is the founder of All Girls Allowed, an advocacy group focusing on protecting women's rights in China. The group is against the country's one-child policy. Also via Skype is Awin Jin. She is joining us from London, where she is a Chinese artist and social commentator. Chai Ling, Awin Jin, welcome to the stream. Thank you so much. Chai Ling, I want to start with you. Uh, how did you react when you first saw the photos of Feng Zhan Mei and her baby? Well, I saw the photo on the internet and my heart just froze, you know. The baby was lying next to the mom and she was fully formed. You can see and feel the warmth of the baby. But yet, you know, we know the baby was, was dead and was brutally executed. And that just broke my heart. And I called the family immediately and uh, learned about the horrible story, what happened to Feng Jianmei. Mei. She was dragged out from her home and they put a pillowcase over her face and five strong men held her down and pressed her fingerprint on the consent form. Then the long needles was injected into her tummy and the poison was injected into the head of the baby. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, my child just came in. And so it was, it was just, you know, horrible situation that's what happened in china when the chinese government you know proud boasts itself it was able to prevent 
400 million births, that means they're telling the whole world they have been able to execute over 400 million babies in such way. Mm. So Kelly, one child, I, I, wanna, I wanna get to you. This one child policy was implemented in 1979 because China just experienced this population boom. They went from 500 million people to nearly a billion people in less than 30 years. Yes. Uh, was there any benefit to the policy? Well, not, a, not really. What happened here is in, from 1970 to 1979, China actually had already started to experience population growth decline. The, there had been already declining rates of population growth through voluntary measures without the one-child policy in place. So what you've seen instead is a very draconian policy that was implemented in 1979-1980 and has since led to uh, all of the abuses that Chai Ling discusses. And it has, it has reduced the birth rate substantially, obviously, you now have, you know, more than you're closing in on on 30 percent of the population having um, just being an only child and all of these sorts of things, and you've seen real changes in the in the demographic makeup of the society as a result. And and China is now at below replacement rate on its um, on its uh, child childbirth levels. So yes, it has had an effect, but you have to balance out what would have naturally occurred and you've seen the same kinds of declines in other countries as they achieve similar levels of economic development. Explain how this naturally occurs. What's going on within the society that people naturally reduce their birth rates without any kind yes. of policy being in place? Well, if you look at countries like South Korea, Taiwan, which is Chinese and, you know, has the same kind of cultural makeup, you've seen as as people um, economically develop and and have greater education, more access to preventative services and and to birth control and are able to naturally control their own decisions about their childbirth and child spacing population decline sets in as people as women join the workforce become more educated they stop having as many children it just happens as the natural um, kind of knock-on effect of economic development I'd like to get our community in here. There's a tweet from Louise who says, it's a tough one. People should be allowed to do as they wish in this regard and not be controlled by the government. But Jen, I want to bring you in here because on the other side, we have several tweets from people saying, this isn't a bad policy. Crim Criminal P says, it's not a bad policy as far as curbing overpopulation is concerned. Countries need to have a population they can take care of. And one more from Colm who says, the world is overpopulated already and China is the only country doing anything about it unless you count the U.S. <laughs> war, uh, Combs says, but uh, it, to you, doesn't a country have the right to uh, enact population control? Um, we have to say that China introduced this policy based on the idea they tried to push the country into a faster pace of economic growth, and that's very crucial. So instead of wait for another 20 or 30 years for the population to decline by itself, it's actually fast forward the whole pace to put China into that, you know, you know, economic, you know, growth we are seeing right now is booming. And also, like the guest has said, the, ch the Chinese women, literally the Chinese women have always been working. We know China went to the war and the Chinese women was half doing half the job as the men. So they always have that, you know, strength of being half of the whole half of the sky. So in that sense, the, the one child policy was implemented so the government can hold the control on the people. I absolutely don't think that's the right thing to do. What I always, because for me, I'm an artist, for, so I always look at it into this uh, human stories and personal experience. I myself is a one-child policy. I'm the first generation of daughters, Chinese daughters of one-child policy. And I'm able to come to Britain and do my studies here. And I have heard over and over again people so shocked that I can travel to anywhere I want to do the career I choose to and to achieve things I want to, just because my parents has raised me up as a son. So I really want people to, yes, I know the forced abortion is a huge topic, but the one child policy is like a double edged sword. It has the good point, which lifted the Chinese women, gave them a bit more power, so they been raised up like sons, and then they can experience life a bit more fulfilling. Until a certain point, the social pressure, the cultural pressure from the one child policy brought this ambitious Chinese women down to earth. And then they can't achieve what they wanted to do because they have the one child policy to force them not only 
to have mm -hmm. one child. Oh, Ling, I, I want to bring you in. Uh, yep. in. In terms of what Jin is saying, do you think that this one-child policy has aspects where it has lifted up Chinese women? Oh, not at all. It further degraded women, and it created a massive gender side issue from our research. We statistics, the Chinese government's official gender imbalance issue is 119 to 100. The poor village we're going to is three to one. Basically, people are killing their baby girls and in the womb to make room for the boys. And as we're speaking in the past couple of days, the story surfaced of this baby girl was abandoned and because she was prematurely uh, born, she has a stab wound in her throat. This is, you know, every year there are over a million baby was, abo was abandoned. That's because they were born uh, girls. One of every six girls that need to be born were killed at birth. Who is to say this kind of massive genocide is a result of improving the woman's status? And can our research also too, shows 90% you know, of women suffer sexual harassment at a professional it's setting. Ever and in addition, there's massive sex trafficking in China to set aside over 40 million and a growing single man. Massive sex trafficking, commercial sex well, industry. Well, there's, there's members of our community there, that are I, agreeing I, with what you're saying. Lindsay says the forced sterilization, infanticide that result by ignoring other social problems and long-term gender balance skews can't be ignored. Kelly, I want to bring you in here, though. There's a video comment from a member of our community. Have a listen. Noticed in regards to this one-child policy was gender equality propaganda popping up all over China. Um, the Chinese government has been trying to undo some of these um, negative effects from the one-child policy um, in the form of, you know, signs that say your daughter can carry on the family name and just really trying to push that gender equality. Um, and so I guess my question is, has the Chinese government done enough? What are they currently doing and what should they do in the future? So we have Jin and Ling on two sides saying yes. what this has done for that gender, gender uh, inequity. Um, what would you say? Well, it is complicated. I think that you can certainly cite the statistics on gender imbalance and the levels of female infanticide, of uh, female um, infant in abandonment, um, to say that the cultural preference for male children um, remains very much alive in China today. And so when, if women are only going to have one child and there is this strong cultural preference for a male child, then you're going to see a lot of selective abortion. You're going to see um, abandonment of girl children. And so this has been a problem since the beginning of the one-child policy. It's been a problem even before that, to be honest, just because of the preference for male children historically in Chinese society. So that, that is a very real problem. It's led to this massive gender imbalance in the birth rate. And it's um, got far-reaching potential even security implications for China. But then at the other end, the Chinese government recognizes this. They know it's a problem. They have been doing, as the, um, as the viewer said, all of this propaganda, you go out to the villages and the family planning organizations have put up big signs, big character posters saying, you know, your girl child is as precious as a boy child and right. things like this. But it's not, you know, the, 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 deep, the deep beliefs and especially out in the rural areas tend to just overwhelm some of this and it's, it's taking, it's going to take a long time. It's having an effect in the cities and in the urban areas. You see it evening out, but the bigger problems are out in the provinces and out in the countryside. Jen, you know, we're talking about what the government is doing now in terms of its uh, softening its message, but it wasn't that long ago where they were very, very scary messages that the government was putting out. Recently, the BBC cited some of them. One of them was, kill all your family if you don't follow the rule. Another one was, if you escape, sterilization is what they're talking about. If you escape, we'll hunt you down. If you want to hang yourself, we'll give you the rope. Yeah, absolutely. There, when people look at the policy, instead it's had one off. It's a right, it's a, the good thing or it's a bad thing. I think it's something in the middle. It's something, you know, there have good parts and the bad parts. And we have to look at the Chinese country. It's a huge country. The difference, the living standard difference from the city and the village is massive. And we can't just glue them all together. If we really did that, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you and doing my work. So the, the people is like in the city, when they have a, a child, they haven't got the time to decide it's a boy or girl. They are very happy. I have done personally over 300 people, women, across the country for my uh, art project. Just to, because from my personal experience, so I want to see if anyone sharing my view, even the people in the villages. 
I know there's a still horrible things happen, and I personally know people have gone through that. And I also wanted to show people, but it has a positive effect as well. It's not so much to do with the policy at all. Do you know when the policy maker set up the policy, they have not had in mind at all it's going to benefit women. It's only later they realize actually the women are benefiting. The new generation of the daughter are benefiting from this. They haven't. They don't need to share their resources where they're with their uh, brothers or sisters. They can go abroad to study. The parents like you, uh, the, the other guest said, there's a whole generation above them, grandfather, grandparents, to, to, through all their encouragements and everything, all the resources for the, for the daughter to succeed. So okay. that has set a very high bar. I, on the other hand, can give you statistics about China is the biggest country in the world that females take on more MBA courses than any other country. Well, and there, and are, there that's, that is true. I mean, there are all kinds of problems for women you. in China, though, as well, like yes, 500 women committing suicide a day in China. I mean, it's... Yes, yeah. Yeah. Every it's country has the problems. Really Every uh, country has their own problems. Yeah. If we only look at that, then you just say, <laughs> okay, the reason I'm sitting Look, I want to give, I wanna give Ling a chance to jump in here. She's go been waiting, we, yes. we've been waiting patiently. Ling, go sure. ahead. Yes, so I want to, I have another story about similar story of another girl who was able to come to America to study. And be, the day before she had returned to China, she realized her parents killed her baby sister to you know, to, to save the fine they would pay for that baby, uh, baby brother to, to be born, to send her to America to study. So there's a massive cost of this artificial one-child policy to force the parent to choose one way versus other. We cannot fight evil you know, with evil. But so gender side itself is wrong. But because Ling, all men are created, you know, equal men and women uh, in front of God. But we cannot say Ling, because of the white I, policy, it I, have lifted women. It hasn't. But whose responsibility is it? If the government has this policy in place and they say you're only permitted to have one child, if you have more than one, you have to pay this fine, is it the responsibility of the parents then to acknowledge that I don't have enough money or resource to support a second child and then make sure they only have one? Well, there are several problems. The first one, the policy itself is fundamentally flawed and you need to be come to end right away. It's China's Holocaust that's been going for more than 30 years. The world needs to do something about it. And the second thing is the people are also participating in this massive evil. Gender size itself is not what the government is responsible for, but the culture is. And so there are two sides of the issue. And the third thing is when the gender imbalance being created as a result of the gender side and one child policy and that sex trafficking start taking place mm -hmm. and then when sex trafficking start taking place guess what china is, is developing its military ambition to absorb those 40 million single men and that's potentially global uh, creating global war you called it china's holocaust ling you called it china's holocaust and there's a tweet here um, asking whether or not this should be brought to the chinese people and whether or not they should make a judgment on that. Sam says, China's people have been living with this law for a long time. If they need a change, I think a referendum should be <laughs> held. But Kelly, um, on that note, ponder that. But I'd also like to um, consider the fact that this may or may not be over-exaggerated in the media and whether or not um, there are exceptions to this rule. There's a video comment here to that effect. Well, there certainly are Have exceptions. Have a As people think, and there are a lot of ways that Chinese people get around the one-child policy, like um, paying a fine and having another child. Uh, ethnic minorities can have more children, people in rural areas. Um, but if you've been in one of China's urban centers in, in Beijing, Shanghai, or Guangzhou, you, you know that there's so much congestion and there's so much competition among people that it leads to suicides at Beijing University that we don't often hear about, for example. So we see that there is a need in Chinese society for some kind of a policy measure to control uh, the population. So Masu said there is a need, but he also says there are loopholes. There, there are loopholes, and right now you only have about 80% of the population that's actually subject to the one-child rule. About 20% of the population is uh, able to avail themselves of certain loopholes, including 
four to one families where both parents are an only child. They can have a second child um, even without paying the penalty. Ethnic minorities, as he said, can, and, and certain people out in rural areas can have a second child if their first child is a, is a girl. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of, um, there are increasing number of loopholes. And in some cities, including in Shanghai, they are starting to experiment with removing the one child policy altogether because there are serious concerns at the highest levels of the Chinese government about the demographic crash that is bearing down on China because of the, the long-term effects of this policy. So you see the Chinese government aware to a certain extent that they have problems because of it, that they will face economic problems, social problems, a, a whole range of, of issues that this policy has created for them. But at the same time, this policy at the local level is, is very popular with local officials because these fines, they're $6,000 plus dollars to have a second child out of plan. And this is um, a roughly equivalent to the average GDP annual income of a Chinese family. So popular so for, for these local officials. They make money. It's a money making, maker. It's obviously a, mo a money maker. So you but best will, we see a change? Level. will we see a change, especially with the case that we're talking about here, where yes. it's being posted on social media? Well, that and that's has a rural area. It has enraged people. This mm -hmm. this um, I think this is a really important point to bring out, that the fact that the Chinese people are actually able to see this happen and see the human cost of it. And is this the first time when and, this happened? Oh, this is the first time I think that it's nationally become an issue where it was on the Chinese equivalent of Twitter, where people were tweeting it and talking about it and really make, getting upset. And it happened at the same time that China had their first manned space launch. And so there was this comparison between the barbarism that people saw with this um, this forced abortion and the high tech and the, the, the kind of shining image that China was trying to right. project by putting someone to, into space. So there was a lot of commentary about the, this contrast and how can a country that is so civilized be so barbarous at the same time. So it's really provoking a serious debate among the Chinese people. And while they can't have a real referendum because it's an authoritarian country, obviously, um, I think that you are going to see increasing social pressure for people to be able to make more choices in their personal lives, which is an area that people's freedoms have been expanding in China. All right, and on that note, we're going to hit the pause button, so everybody stay put. We're going to continue our discussion on China's one-child policy in our online post show, but first we want to get to Malika, who's got a few other stories that we're following. Costa Ricans are showing support for an official fired over a racy video. Using the Spanish slogan, Todas Somos Carina, or We Are All Carina, more than 200 people have posted pictures like this, backing Carina Bolaños, the Vice Minister of Culture. Bolaños was dismissed after a video in which she appears scantily clad and flirts with an off-screen lover was posted online. Bolaños says the video was made when she was separated from her husband and says it was stolen by a hacker. Users were divided. The bad thing is not that Karina Bolaños has recorded this video, it's that there's a sick tendency to publish it, violating her privacy, says Mafi Carrasco. But others, like Juan, disagreed, noting, the moral of the story is, don't make videos. Our next leads from Egypt, where an alleged police shooting in a Cairo neighborhood sparked fury online and on the streets. At least one person was killed and many injured after violence erupted in front of a business tower on the Nile. Witnesses say security guards shot a resident of the nearby area who had entered the tower to demand pay for work he had done. Residents say chaos followed as security forces arrived. Crowds still blocking the streets in complete absence of any security forces. The sad sight of burned cars and motorcycles and destruction, Zayed Murad tweets, posting this picture minutes later. Just when we thought it was over, he says, the clashes erupt again. Tear gas shot into the masses. Well, residents say the situation has calmed down, but we'll continue to follow that story. So tweet us updates with the hashtag AJStream. Lisa? Thanks, Malika. Stay with us because the post show is next. It's streamed at aljazeera.com. Now on Monday, after a gang rape video went viral in India, we look at the rights of women and what's being done to protect them. We'd love to start hearing your questions and comments on that. And remember, you can always go to our website and click the red video button and send us a video comment or question that we'll play during the show. So keep that in mind. And until Monday, we'll see you online.
this kind of underlying Welcome back to the Online Post Show. We're going to pick up our discussion where we left off. And uh, Ling, I want to go back to you. Um, we were talking about the, the use of social media in really making this case, Feng Jian Mei's case, um, more prominent than any other case of its like in the past. Uh, do you attribute social media to all of the traction that this is getting worldwide? Absolutely, and it's also got perfect timing. That baby, um, Feng Jian Mei was dragged into uh, the forced abortion clinic by June 2nd, and on June 4th, her baby came out. Um, her baby was black and blue, as you can see from the picture. Now, what happened to these babies when they were injected poison, they start suffocating. Some other cases, they're saying the baby will come out with the fingernails full of flesh, flesh, you know, uh, they, because they were so in so much pain. But the idea suffering. that people it's are actually seeing these images now in a major way, I mean, there was a, a, a prominent yes. businessman in China that retweeted, he was retweeted 18,000 times. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's got to have an effect. That's got to make the Chinese government sit up and take notice in a way that perhaps it hasn't in the past. Absolutely, and also media, international media like yourself, Al Jazeera has been fantastic. You know, Melissa Chen reported a forced abortion case or video in, uh, from 2010, and uh, that was a Fujian situation, even though she, the family believed they have the reason to have one more baby, but they still, the local authority make this into a profit-making situation, so they forced her board her eight-month-old baby, and that, you know, her, mm -hmm. her baby fetus dead in the valley was captured mm -hmm. on television. Right. So both the local media and also the international media, like yourself, has been instrumental in this whole situation. We believe this year is a year God will end this brutal one-child policy in China. We'll encourage all of you to continue to join us in this battle, to advocating for those who have no voice to speak out for themselves. Kelly, especially. do you think it's possible that there's going to be a reversal on this policy? Well, I they're certainly so, yes. looking at it. As I said, in Chiang Mai, I, I'm sorry, in Shanghai, <laughs> Chiang Mai's in Thailand. In Shanghai, they um, are, are, think, are, are slowly rolling it back, and in other urban areas, they're looking at it. The problem is that what they're, they're trying, I think, to, to square the circle by having urban, more wealthy families have more children, but they don't want to. Even when they're given the opportunity to, they're still only having one child, and it's an economic decision on their part. Mm -hmm. And they're they're just you know they're going to have to start doing some of the things that European countries are doing now to raise their birth rate with these families. And those those things in China may actually work because it is an economic decision. But if the policy were to go away. Would it need to be replaced with something? Yes, I think that they will have to. In, in you know, in some areas where there are very poor areas that are overpopulated, they'll have to continue some. They will. They'll feel the need to continue some population controls. But there are much less coercive ways to achieve the same goals. And demographers and experts in the field can can help them to develop policies that will be more effective in terms of raising the level of information and knowledge that women have and are able to then make their own choices and will choose to limit the size of their families. Well, Jen, earlier in the show, we talked a little bit about loopholes, these one-child loopholes, and I'm wondering whether we are seeing a discrepancy between people in urban uh, areas and people in rural areas. There's a tweet here from N. Sparky who says, if we're concerned with resource use and government spending, mm -hmm. which is why, why one child is in place, then we need to examine consumption and distribution. Uh, are, uh, uh, can you speak speak to that? Um, I think in China, I think people, we talked about the forced abortion, now it become a tool for the officials to make money. So the basic thing, fundamental thing in China now ta to tackle is actually corruption. Because in the early uh, 80s, and uh, in the 80s, throughout the 80s and early 90s, this kind of forced abortion was happened in much, much more, happened so much more than now. Mm -hmm. At that time, nobody reporting it like uh, you know our guests have said because we don't have the media technology right now they're having this and then it's expulsion not anything else but purely corruption so because actually in the villages you now uh, many villages now has already allowed to have two children per, per, per family and uh, as uh, uh, kelly has mentioned you know there's uh, in, in china there is a 56 ethnic groups there are only one ethnic groups that was banned by this law. All the other babies policy, other groups can have as many children as they wanted. But the, the Han has, like uh, Kelly said, is 80% of the population of Han. So the Chinese is trying to 
slow down the growth of this particular ethnic group. But mainly, it's really a problem about corruption, and that's why we say the uh, governments have, uh, you know, took out the jobs for these uh, people who are involved in this scandal. And Kelly, Ling, there, there, Ling, yeah. Jin is talking about ethnic groups. Uh, sorry to cut you off. Um, sure. But there's a Facebook comment here from Bod who says China's coercive population control policies, including campaigns of mass sterilizations, have uh, been forced on, he says, oppressed people such as Tibetans, Muslim Uyghurs. There are atrocities that can't be justified. So can you speak about those minority communities? I, because I have friends, like again, when I do the research, I have to include as many people as possible, varieties. And uh, who has the, they, okay, I personally have friends who studies in Japan, lives in Japan now, and uh, she has a brother back at home, and uh, the brother is going to Japan very soon to join her for study. So you see, so uh, because they are different ethnic groups, I even surprised, I said, oh, how did you met family, family manage that? So that's what she told me. But she is not from Tibet, and personally, I not. I couldn't say anything for them because I don't have experience. I'm only an artist and uh, cultural commentator researcher for my art project. I can only, again, tell people about my experience. Of course. Through that, to raise the awareness of the policy, of a different side, of a deeper, more in-depth understanding of this policy, rather than we just look at one direction, oh, God, it's to save the earth. The other, oh, it's a forced abortion. Actually, there's so much more going on. Kelly, I want to get back to something that Jin mentioned, and she was talking about corruption. Mm -hmm. And there are some estimates that the fine for noncompliance, which the Chinese call the social maintenance fee, yes. has earned the government more than $314 billion right. since 1980. Yes. How much does corruption and economics play into all of this? I think it is a huge um, reason that this po this policy is still in place. As, as, I, as I mentioned during the regular show, the, the, the economics of this policy, I think, are driving it more than sensible demographic policy. Um, people recognize the problems that it's created and the, the long-term yeah. problems, but the immediate problem of a Chinese official in a village or province is meeting their budgetary requirements and, and frankly, the corruption that is required to grease the whole Chinese system and keep it functioning is, is epic. And this is a huge area for corruption. And your, um, your former Beijing correspondent, Melissa Chan, has done some incredible work on this, um, both the, the policies um, for women who are pregnant, as well as children who are stolen by local officials after they've been alive for five or six years from farmers and people in the villages. And the local officials find out about these children after the fact and go and steal them and sell them on the black market. It is just a, a creating all sorts of appalling problems. And there's a lot of money involved. And that is, you know, the resistance to it at the local level and the, yeah. the amount of money it brings in is, I think, the leading factor of why this policy remains in place. Well, I want to wrap this up and I, I want to get your final thoughts. You've got an excellent bird's eye view of everything in terms of what's going on there, how the researchers are responding, how the government's responding. How do you see this playing out? I think over time, the, the government in Beijing is going to continue to pull the policy back as they have slowly and in a calibrated way. It, they're not doing it fast enough to deal with the problems that it's created and is continuing to create, but they have no other way to manage it because of the, the other knock-on effects of pulling it back, because they're, they're in this double-bind situation where if they pull it back too fast, local officials who depend on it for revenue are going to be in an uproar, and they're not going to be able to replace the funding that it generates with other sources of income, especially as the other main source of income for local governments dries up, which is land confiscations. And those are increasingly, you know, part of the online debate in China as well and have gotten to be a much bigger issue and, and a source of national um, anxiety because of the ability of people to connect across the country when land is confiscated illegally by government officials. So all of these illicit sources of revenue are coming under increasing pressure because China is increasingly plugged in and able to, the people are able to, to see and expose them. So it's, it's a very challenging time for the government to manage these things. Kelly Curry, Chai Ling, and Owen Jin, thank you so much. And thanks to our community for all of your terrific questions and comments. We'll look forward to seeing you again for our show on Monday. Until then, we'll see you online.